are you doing? Well, if you're aunt like me, you're moved. And uh, yeah, I, I, I genuinely am so moved by you and uh, by your boat. And you know, you are the keynote speakers here. Like that was so powerful and so courageous. And it's people like you and your testimonies and your generosity that will change things for so many others. So I want to say a huge thanks again. Can we give them a <clears throat> um, You know, it's, it's that feeling that most of us have right now, that sort of combination of um, sadness, frustration, anger, inspiration, love, all of it. The soup, that's the stuff that if we harness it and if we channel it, that's how we create change. Um, sometimes those kind of emotions, they can become so overwhelming. Um, they can become, is this, am I? Yeah, either or, okay, do a Beyonce, will I? <laughs> um, I'll stick with this one. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, I think when we look at um, the vast scale of problems, challenges, issues facing our, our little island on the edge of the Atlantic, the edge of Europe, um, it, it is so easy to become overwhelmed and you know overwhelm is a dangerous thing because it can lead to uh, in some sense lead to despair because it, it, it takes us over so we need to catch hold of that th those range of emotions that we just felt or are feeling and decide and make a commitment that that we're going to do something with it and, and that's how we create movements because when I was coming here this morning I was thinking I was very much having this awkward feeling of imposter syndrome and the, the truth is I, I didn't and still don't know enough about uh, dementia. I, I, you know, when I was asked to speak it was largely around the theme of community engagement and social movements but then the closer it got to today I realised the less I knew and the more I started looking into it the more I realised I didn't know and again that sense of overwhelm started to come over me. But then I thought back to a few weeks ago of visiting my grandmother in a nursing home in, in Donegal, and she's in her mid 90s now. And I thought about that feeling um, that I get increasingly when I go to visit her, which isn't really a good one, to be honest. It's, it's a feeling of kind of guilt, shame, uh, embarrassment, discomfort, fear. Uh, because every time I go to see my gran, I'm, I'm not sure if she's going to recognise me again. And, and that's, that's the depth of what we're talking about here. It, it cuts to the core of humanity, of love, of connection, of what it means to be human. So in essence, we're not just talking about dementia, we're talking about life. And, and what, I, what I experienced and witnessed this morning was it's not just about the sadness of life, it's about the beauty of life. And, and I'm sure you, you both find that in taking on these challenges that it, it opens up the cracks for the magic to also appear. Because I also looked through the videos of the, the campaign and I was, I, I'm, not, I'm not a great fella for crying to be honest. <laughs> but the, looking at the bench is doing a good job on me so far. Um, I better tell my wife this. I think somebody's videoing it. So, uh, but you know, it, it is emotional uh, movement again that I say that, that will create the movement for change. But looking at the videos, I'm, I'm just took a note of their names: the Mullen family, Jane and Sean, and and they said um, they're committed to to not sink under the weight of it. Um, Paddy and Lindsay, um, I loved what Paddy said. He said. Do I hide it? I love the way he said it as well. He said, do I hide it or do I be straight? I'll be straight. And it was pure country commitment. And I loved it. It just was such a one-liner and said so much. And now he said more people talk to him now than ever spoke to him. And he said it in a joking manner. Um, and then obviously Maureen in Kilkenny, um, she talked about how she, she, she seemed to be quite a younger woman to me and how she was kind of losing her functionality at work but that is very much the connection of neighbours and community. And she really highlighted a lot of the positives in her experience as well. And like Cathy's video completely blew me away. And 
just to pay tribute to your sons as well. Is it Matt and Andrew? Yeah. yeah. They're like an 18 and a 19 year old lad. And like lads can get a bad rap these days. Um, I you know it's often said that lads struggle emotionally and you know, um, there are many issues around, gen rightfully many issues that need attention around gender equality and women's empowerment and so on. But we've so many fine men around us, we all know them. And those two sons of yours are, are such examples of that, such kind young men. Um, but you also brought up so many other issues, Cathy, in the video about particularly the rural issue. And I'm seeing that myself now. I'm living in the west coast of Clare and I can see the power and the strength of community there. But I can also see the challenges with lack of services and access to transport and so on. And then to lose the, the prospect of driving in rural Ireland. So I think where decisions are made in the capital city and there's Lewis and bus and trains and it might be perfect. But it's, it's a lot better than it is in many other places. And then another fine young man, uh, Sean, down in Kerry, in the video, he, like, I was just so struck by his eyes. If no one's seen these particular videos, go back and look at them. They're all on the understandtogether.ie. Um, but it, it just gave me hope as well to see the, the caliber of people, and particularly also young people, uh, coming through. And I think, you know, it, it is cultivating leadership and compassion in our younger folk um, that, that can kind of guide us to the future. And that's been my experience over the last 20 years. Uh, my background is a lot working with younger folk. And in many ways, um, the themes have been mostly around mental health and civic engagement and political empowerment. But a common theme is around leadership and self-belief and instilling in people the sense that they can make change. That change doesn't necessarily have to come from the top level, from the CEO, from the, the person with their finger on the purse strings, um, from the Taoiseach, from the Taunashta, from the minister. Um, change can come from the most unlikely of places. Um, and as I referenced earlier, it's, it's change from people like Helena and Cathy. That's for me where change comes from. So we need to highlight those voices and to celebrate those voices, but also to go out and cultivate more people, more leaders in the community. Because if there's 50 or, 50 or more thousand people with dementia in Ireland, and that's expected to grow from what I've read in coming years to 100, 150,000, I've read different figures. Um, amongst those people are thousands of leaders. And to hear their stories, but also to have them teaching us, not for us to save them or teach them, but for them to guide us in understanding how to be more compassionate people, how to be more compassionate communities. I've seen this through um, both recent referendums, through the, well, many referendums, in fact, the divorce referendum in the past, obviously, and um, repeal marriage equality. When you see how people's stories strip away the politics and show us that these issues are about humanity, they're about what makes us human, what it means to be alive, and by sharing those stories, we get to realize that we're all in this together and that we too uh, probably know people affected by all of the issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to make judgments around, as, as people have done in the past, around divorce or around marriage equality. But when we know in our extended families, in our colleagues, uh, that people are suffering or affected or being blocked by some of the stigma. And I raise stigma because I see so much commonality around dementia as I do in my experience of looking at mental health. It's, it's an issue that has been in the shadows. I don't understand why I didn't know more about it. I read several newspapers a week. I listen to the news. I read a lot. I've gone to college and I still didn't know enough. So whilst I see that there's great momentum and I think the Understand Together campaign is great and the videos are great and the TV ads are great, um, we do need much more. Um, and I think like mobilizing community champions is the way to go for that. But we can't negate the, the role of the state. Um, you know, for I started out some of my work in life in Donegal in around 18 years ago or so in Letterkenny, and I was doing some work on a national health strategy. And part of that was a new vision for a health service for Ireland. And I was what, I don't know, 23 or something, and I was going, this is great, I'm part of the change there's going to be a new national health service. And 
you know, I've seen two or three moments come and go like that, where it's been great change. And I saw it last year with the, the momentum around Slancha Care. And I got excited about that and I felt I shouldn't give up hope. Maybe it's going to happen. Maybe we can make it happen. But it is hard to despair at our politics, or hard not to despair at our politics. And when you have a state which, that just can't seem to function with basic health and social services, um, it does make you wonder about the, the will and the calibre uh, and, and who our politicians are serving. You know, we, we, we continue to have one of the worst resourced health systems in Europe, and that's going on for too long. And the baseline services and care are needed in the community, right from GPs to nursing homes, to social workers, to recreational activities, to the support of county councils in signage and road design and housing design, uh, in school design, the, the whole plethora we need the state to be functioning and on board and not to continually look to the community and voluntary sector to save everything because we're already carrying more than our fair share. As are, <clears throat> as are the carers of Ireland more than carrying their fair share. And from the carers that I know, it seems that so many of them are just about surviving so when we talk about the needs of the, the people in need, it's in many ways the carers, and you talked about your husband and, and, and you know, the, the different people involved in, in the caring community. Um, so I want to keep that challenge alive to our leaders, um, but the challenge in some ways is interconnected to us as leaders again, because they are not going to lead until we make them lead. So we need to keep the fight alive and we need to keep pushing and we need to keep advocating and we need to keep speaking out. And that's not always easy because we have to challenge sometimes, uh, certainly the status quo, but we have to sometimes challenge our own organisations, our own leadership, our own board. And there's this awkward uh, situation in the voluntary sector in Ireland where we're disproportionately funded by the state. So the thinking is we don't bite the hand that feeds us. But it's our money and it's our state. And we're not trying to bite the hand, we're trying to save the hand. So we need more advocacy and stronger advocacy. And part of the dynamic in that, as I see it, is about courage. And it's the courage to speak up. Not that we're going to, or wanting to upset anybody or anything, but we're wanting to do this out of a caring and a loving place. And when I look at all the testimonies and, and listen to different voices, I keep coming back to that word love as a guiding force. Uh, Martin Luther King used it in the civil rights movement. He talked about a beloved community, that love is the guiding force that will guide us to a better Ireland. Um, we have these reports around Ireland 2020, Ireland 2030, 2040, 2050. They're all grand and we can have lots of uh, milestones and KPIs and strategic objectives. But when are we going to hear talk about values uh, values like decency and dignity, values of care, and I'm, I'm so happy that, um, to hear the word kindness brought up this morning. I want to hear political leaders talk about kindness. You know, I want to hear them talk about compassion, and I think there are votes in that, if they could get their act together as well. Uh, and kindness doesn't cost money, you know? So I think by fostering that, and it's not to apportion blame uh, right up the ladder, it is the collective responsibility but if we can engender a culture from the top and the bottom and all around that it's a more circular economy, that kindness is the dominant currency, that Ireland becomes known or re-known as a kind country, um, then I think there's something powerful, there's some huge potential there. Last night on O'Connell Street, um, I, I was struck by a couple of incidents actually. One of them I was sitting on a park bench, enjoying the sunshine, trying to teach myself not to be on Twitter. <laughs> which some of you might be able to identify with. Um, you know, I, I read something recently about how when we spend so much time online and fill up those moments in the queue of a shop and so on, that, that we can kind of miss the magic around us, you know? And, and I've studied mindfulness and I kind of get it all and then I go straight to my phone, <laughs> look at some mindfulness video or something. Uh, do you know, but I was on the bridge, uh, I think it was the Rosie Hackett Bridge and it was a lovely sunny evening and I just looked over and I caught this woman uh, stroking a young girl's hair 
and um, I was there for maybe 15 minutes and I looked over a couple of times and the, the little girl was obviously distressed over something and I was just really struck by that, the kindness and the love in the gesture. Whatever had distressed the young girl, it could have been any number of things, it could have been bullying, it could have been separation at home, it could have been, there, there's so many things that could, could be at play there. But it, it was so beautiful to notice that and take the time to notice that. And then I had to pop into a chemist for something about uh, 20 minutes later. And I noticed an old kind of uh, woman that was slightly disheveled uh, talking to one of the staff and the chemist. And she said, but what would you do? And the woman was saying, well, if you go for a walk and you just try and think positive thoughts. And I, I started kind of over here. And like this woman was in such distress that she was seeking out a pharmacist <coughs> to try and give her some relief. And, and clearly maybe what guided her into the pharmacy was some sort of pharmaceutical relief. And maybe there's only so much a pharmacist can do about that without a prescription. But what the pharmacist was dispensing was time and kindness on, on busy O'Connell Street. It was the one right near the bridge. And I was really struck by that. And then a couple of minutes later, I was at, I was crossing, um, the, crossing near the Daniel O'Connell statue and I'm always struck by these statues of our great leaders and, and they espouse this better vision of Ireland. But beside the statue was a tour group um, of mostly say like people in their early 20s and a Dublin tour guide that was telling them about marriage equality and how Ireland's a changed place and Ireland's a great place and all of that. And he was referencing Daniel O'Connell and the great changes. But what he was failing to notice was a man um, completely um, comatosed out, lying on the statue. And that's my experience of Dublin in recent years, as it is for many of us. Is, and the danger is that we're now no longer starting to see people that are straight in front of our eyes. There was a human being straight in front of his line of sight, and without any irony, and I don't blame the tour guide at all, but without any irony, he was talking about the, you know, the, the present and the future and the past and ignoring the, the cold reality. And then waking up this morning, I learned someone was stabbed on O'Connell Street. And I feel that in so many ways, um, where we're heading is, as a society is in too many ways. And Enda Kenny said it several years ago, and I'm not party political, but he did say that we're, we're following the American model. And that is the plan and that is the goal. And there are many benefits to that. It's not the worst country on earth by any means. There are many, many others. Um, but with the American model, um, one portion of society gets to detach from the rest of society and, and we get to have ghettos of wealth, uh, ghettos that can exclude themselves out of view with the so-called social problems of society. Whereas that the, in, in reality, they're actually all our problems. We can't just look the other way because we're all connected as humans. And if we start pursuing that model, then we might as well give up as a species. You know, so I do worry about the trend in that regard. Um, so standing for social solidarity has never been more important. And I do think um, we do have a lot to celebrate in that regard in Ireland. So I'm not all down on Ireland. Um, I think if you look at the rise of particularly like the drift towards the far right and, and the racist rhetoric and, and currents that are entering politics in Britain, in the US and elsewhere throughout Europe, we're not that bad. I think there are major issues emerging on the ground but I think it's about holding the line and for community leaders and social leaders and non-profit leaders to keep holding the line of decency and dignity. And I think we're already, we're doing that and we just need to be stronger together. But how do we be stronger together? And for me, that is, that's why we're here. It's about the collective. It's about the sum of all parts being stronger than the individual. Uh, it's about emboldening a sense of community, of a kind of a tribal sensibility, um, and, and the positive aspects of a tribal sensibility. So where I'm now living in, in Clare, um, some of the differences are, are quite stark to where I was living in Dublin. And I, I'm not here down to knock Dublin by any means. I think Dublin's a wonderful place and there are so many pockets of community, vibrant community alive and well in Dublin. But in the particular area that I lived, and one of the dynamics is that I was a renter and I couldn't afford to, to buy a house, so I never fully committed to where I was living, at least mentally didn't. So I didn't really feel that much part of the community, and in some ways the community sees renters and doesn't, well, they'll probably be gone anyway. So there are issues with housing, for instance, in, in all facets of life. But having moved to the West, 
Um, I'm now into that kind of, so, so the moral of that story is I didn't really know my neighbours over an eight year period and I began to kind of feel a sadness about that because I'm from a small town originally in Cavan and I used to know all my neighbours, I love saying hello to all my neighbours and that idea that you know them, they know you and they'll have your back if your back ever needs to be, to be got if you're ever in a, a tight spot and within seven months of living in Clare I now have that again and I had to put some work into making it happen. I had to show up for things and make an effort and, you know, kind of do some dishes here and there and so on at different events and, and muck in. But already, like, I was feeling this sense of the tribe and the mehel. And for me, that's the wider philosophy at play here is that sense of, um, it's, it's not necessarily, I, I don't want to say it's all to do with an old Ireland because I still think it's alive but it's something that is under pressure by the cult of um, pushing for individual gain. And I, I also heard an interesting quote, I think it might have been uh, Malcolm X or someone, in, again, another civil rights leader, talked about um, putting the kind of we back into society versus the I in society, and that the word wellness, if you take the word illness and transform the I in illness, it becomes, and put a we in it, it becomes wellness. So I think this I, we question, is a big one and I think we need a society and an Ireland that is much more about the we and I think I'll speak again some of our politics has been about too much of the I but it's about us to keep fostering that and that sense of neighbourliness is key and I feel the benefits of that myself. I, I'm also struck by um, reading and learning a little bit about the role of creativity and the arts in support uh, for people with dementia, of singing, of dance, of music. And the garden thing also struck me as well because I think as a, as a civilization in some ways we've become detached from our greater home which is ecology, which is nature around us, which, is the, which are the plants and the sky and the sea and the forests. And to get people out and about can restore well-being for all of us, not just people with dementia. So I think when we look at housing or services or supports, we, we now need to start thinking about ecology as part of that and us as part of ecology. And I think it's the young people that are now waking us up to what we may have forgotten in terms of the climate um, action protests and so on. So I, I, think, um, I think the kind of combination of those things, compassion, community, creativity, ecology, and challenging the status quo are all key. But in creating this movement, we need to pull all this energy together. The energy that we felt this morning when we felt so moved to change. And we need to decide if we believe that change is possible. Because if we don't believe that we can have a new health service, new social services, that Ireland can be a great place for people with dementia, that Ireland can be a compassionate place, a kinder place, if we don't believe that in our hearts, then we can't achieve it. So, you are the ones that are charged with leadership in terms of your individual roles and your decision to show up here either in an individual or a professional capacity or both. But you need to leave here with a belief that change is possible. And I, I, I put myself in that too because sometimes I, I do wonder and I, I mentioned earlier sometimes I despair that, that Ireland, that, that we can change. But when I hear the testimonies this morning and I look around me and I looked at the videos and see the campaign and see the momentum, I do genuinely have that belief. I think we can do it. And I think we just need to be bolder and to be stronger and to, to claim this country as ours and to claim the future of this country. It's a beautiful country. It's, it's, it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Our people are amongst the kindest in the world. We already do have strong communities. We just need to do more of it and do it better and to restore that energy and it's the belief and the collective <coughs> momentum that will bring it together and that's what creates a movement. It's the belief and passion and drive and target and passion and people like Helena and Cathy and the team behind today that will, that will achieve the change. I see it's already happening and I believe it's going to happen and I look forward to the future and I for one have, have been deeply have made the decision to commit to being part of this journey to make Ireland a better place for people with dementia. Um, I'm, again, I want to say a huge thanks to you again because I, uh, I can't say enough about how moved I am. It's, it's a long time since 
you know, it was one thing reading the national strategy, 50 pages of it or whatever it was. Um, but, you know, th that didn't get into my heart and, and you did. And so, you know, let's forge on together. So thank you, folks. Thank you.